Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sky Sports F1 podcast with me, Matt Baker. We're going to use this week's podcast as an opportunity to preview the Chinese Grand Prix, the first time we've gone to Shanghai in five years. <laughs> uh, and to help me do that, I'm joined by a very colourful Craig Slater on location in China with some, for those of you listening, just put some fireworks, I think, through his through his. I didn't effects. do that. Did you do that? I didn't. Do, that wasn't. No. That was <laughs> <laughs> He's really pushing our software here to the to the to the furthest it can go. Um, and joining Craig is our very own Bernie Collins as well. Bernie, how are you? I'm good, thank you, Matt. How are you? Yeah, really well, thanks. A little croaky, so apologies. I think hay fever season is just starting here in the UK. So uh, if I sound a little bit croaky, that's why. Um, look, Craig, you're back in China. You flew in flew in yesterday. It's been five years since we were there. So what's the feeling on the ground? Good to be back. <laughs> I'm delighted to be back. It's it's really important, uh, I think, uh, that this race not just returns to the calendar, but maybe stays on it as well. Uh, Toto Wolf uh, has just released his comments before the, the Grand Prix, and it's pretty much all about the importance of China as a place where if F1 should race, the biggest car market in the world, it has been for, for 10 years or so, it's a, a big place, obviously, over, over a billion people here. It, it's a, somewhere that F1 can, can grow and prosper. So I think important that this weekend goes well, uh, I think. Now, the contract for the Grand Prix, people might know this, is for only this year and next year. I can shine a light, shine a lantern <laughs> on, on uh, how... It's going to proceed from there because there are, there are going to be discussions about extending it. But I think both sides want to see how this weekend goes. After the gap, we are expecting a sellout crowd, but expect talks to take place in the wake of this. Hopefully successful event. And, and let's see if F1 can, can reestablish itself here. Where it? Was it 2004, the first Grand Prix year? I think so. It's... It's a 20-year tradition now. It's, it's a decent footprint, but, but the sport will want to, to, to build it out, I think, especially the car manufacturers. Yeah, it's firmly now on the calendar, isn't it, in the form, in the Formula 1 schedule, and it has been for some time. Sounds like a very, very key weekend, then, in the future of the Chinese Grand Prix. And, Bernie, when, when we last raced in China five years ago, you were working with Racing Point with yes, Sergio Perez and, yeah. and Lance Stroll. So, look, life's changed a bit for you since then. You're not in China this this week. You're at home. <laughs> yeah, de- and, you know, definitely. I think it is, like Craig said there, we, we didn't imagine when we were leaving in 2019 it would be such a gap before we came back again. And I think, you know, simple things, you know, that Craig has said there, the sellout crowd, you know, I don't remember China in the past being a sellout crowd, but having, you know, Zhou Guan Yu on the, on the um, driver listing has got really going to help that. And imagine having, you know, such a break in a sport. Five years is a long time not to be anywhere. They must be very excited to have it back. He's the first face you see, Bernie. Uh, <laughs> Joe's at the airport. Ahead of Lewis Hamilton and uh, Max Verstappen, it's quite cool. Craig, just paint a picture there of, of what you see then when you land. It's purely Zhou Guan Yu, is it, with a with a smattering of the world champions? Yeah, that, I mean, it's not overboard. And I think, picking up on what Bernie said, you, you could come to Shanghai in previous years and, and drive into town and not necessarily be aware that the F1 is on. Um, so I'm hoping to see a little bit more advertising around uh, maybe a bit more on the local TV, which I've been trying to, to watch as well. The Joel thing is 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 curious, isn't it? Because some people have told me maybe not too many business figures in China have got behind him. Maybe there's been a bit of a sense that China wants winners. It doesn't want athletes, sports people coming 12th, 13th on a regular basis. You know, And maybe having someone like that it's, it's almost detrimental to the nation's interest uh but I, I i i can't imagine that being the case i remember a few years ago uh meeting up with some of the uh, the lewis hamilton supporting young young chinese fans who he kind of calls the secret service because they would always know what flight he was on and mm. and they'd, they'd be there to, to meet him and they seem to have all these all these details and they were talking about Lo Deng in the NBA, about the impact that had on, on, on basketball being popular in, in China. Snooker's on the television here a lot, and we know how good the young Chinese cohort are. 
in, in snooker as well. A lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of key decisions then to be made uh, coming up with, with regards to the Chinese Grand Prix. I imagine if Zhou Guan Yu does have a good result, or there is a lot of good noise around him this weekend, then it probably will contribute to to the future of, of the Chinese Grand Prix. Um, look, we've got so much coming up. We're going to um, be talking about why this is one of the most unpredictable races in Formula One in in years. Uh, we're going to also take a look at the new sprint format, which makes its debut in its current form for the 2024 season this weekend in China. We're going to discuss who the conditions uh, out, out in Shanghai might favour. But first, and this is something I wanted to talk to you, uh, Craig, about, because you've, you've well, there's there's been no shortage of storylines, has there, since, since we last went racing out in Japan. Um, we've had Fernando Alonso sign a new deal with Aston Martin that's going to keep him racing there till 2026. He'll be 45, no less, when he when he finishes uh, at the end of that contract, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's young. <laughs> um, we've also had the 2025 calendar announced. Uh, that's probably the headline from that being that we're going to start in Australia for the 2025 season. So sort of a, a slightly more traditional look to that to the to the calendar. But also, Craig, you've been spending a bit of time at the and I'm going to use inverted commas here opening of the Andretti factory, and I wonder if you could just provide a little update about what you found there, given that. Andretti have been told by Formula One, the commercial rights holders, there was no chance of an entry for 25 and 26. They're pressing ahead, aren't they, anyway? And, and what's their sort of, yeah, what's their what's their ambition going forward? Yeah, it's, it's people are surprised that, I suppose, the last thing they heard was it was, it was a no entry for them. It was, it was a, you're not getting in 25 or 26. And lo and behold, here they're opening their, their new factory. They're spending a lot of money still uh, the Andretti's, M millions of pounds. They've got 120 staff on the payroll in the UK. They want to raise that to 400. Off camera, some interesting discussions with those involved in the project signaled to me that they, they, they still believe they can, they can persuade Formula One management. They got the certification from the FIA, but they, they, they believe they can win the arguments were that they didn't add value to the sport. That's what F1 said. That they wouldn't be competitive enough to, to, to improve things. And that also that they, they, they need to bring in something a bit more substantial than a partnership with General Motors. Formula One wants this, this actual engine to be developed and built, which Michael Andretti told me that is happening. It will be there and available hopefully from 2028. But they want a couple of years to bed in uh, they don't just want to debut a new team and a new engine all at once. And they are conscious they have become this slightly political football in the in the friction between Formula One management and, and the governing body, the FIA. They're, they're a little bit caught in the middle of that because the FIA have obviously pushed them forward as, as, as something that should be happening. But very impressive people. I mean, I'm, I'm even surprising no one. Uh, if you were around Michael Andretti, and his father, they, 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 they're so substantial. I mean, they, 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 they're, they're legends of motor racing. It would be great to have them involved in Formula One. Uh, you know, how many of the big characters do we still have, uh, you know, it, it, in terms of the team bosses and, and people like that in the sport? There aren't many of the stature of the Andretti. So I, in that sense, I think they'd be an asset. Yes, they have to 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 show they're a net asset to the sport, commercial terms as well. But I'm glad to see them pressing ahead. Bernie, I was going to, I wanted to ask you if, you, if you weren't working, obviously if you weren't working for Sky, but say you were sort <laughs> of a free agent in Formula One right now and the Andretti, the Andretti came calling and said, look, we want you to join this team. Here's the catch. There's no firm, clear date in which we are going to be on the Formula One grid. It must be an odd feeling for those people employed by that team to be working towards this, I'm going to say open goal in the most pure sense of, of an open goal, right? Yeah, definitely. You know, and it's it's difficult, you know, as Craig alluded to there, setting up a new F1 team is a massive challenge, let alone setting up a new engine team. So it doesn't surprise me that they want to do that in steps to bring in people, you know, if I think of my own thing, to say, right, you've got a clean slate on strategy, you can do whatever you want to, build a team around you, that is hard. It's hard to set it up, get the software in place, get the historic data, get all of the things that you 
a team works on, you know, we work a lot on historic data. That's not readily available to those of us that, you know, we're just um, kicking around in the sidelines. So it's just, it's very difficult. And then, like you say, to recruit the right people in the team below you with no definitive end game. It's a big risk, you know, and maybe someone in a senior position can take that risk, but a lot of the junior people won't be in the safe position of being fit to take any of those risks. Um, so it will feel like a big risk and it is very hard to get everything built around, you know, this two, three, four year end goal um, because it's just it's going to be very difficult, I think, to, to get the right people without first having a little show of hand of, of where you could be or what you do. And, you know, the factory is probably the first physical step of that. That's the first sign of a real intent you know, not the first time, but it's a physical sign on the ground in Silverstone for the people that they're trying to recruit that they are serious. This is not going away. Um, and that will encourage people to get behind the project and devote, you know, devote their time to the project. Craig, did you did you go in the factory? I'm 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 sort of slightly intrigued. Did like what what's in there <laughs> if they're not building cars? Shine the lamp. So shine yeah. shine the lamp. <laughs> the lanterns back out. It's, it's... <laughs> Then it's a it's a effectively a design office at the moment. So it's it's it, 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 ultimately they're going to it'll be the, the aerodynamicists will work in on that campus in Silverstone next to where Aston Martin are, and the, the, the finished product will be assembled over in Indianapolis. Uh, so there's there's very little in other than desks and computers at the moment. But some of what Bernie said there, I think. People will ask them, well, why aren't they buying an existing team? Why is that the better move? Because if they're saying you need time to ramp up to, to make something that's, that's got to function, then, then why not do that? They genuinely believe that the coming at it afresh is, is a better base. They can improve on what already exists. Uh, and not only that, but I, I think whatever avenues they've looked at in terms of buying teams, just, I don't think it's been feasible for them or, or necessarily value for money either. So that I think that there's no real obvious seller at the moment. People are talking about Haas or, or maybe RB or or Alpine as, as potential outfits they could buy, but, but none of those looks like a workable solution. And they've gone quite far down the other road now setting up the team and when you think about it there aren't so many competitions that what why would you have to acquire if you're Andretti another racing team uh, just to go racing in Formula One so I think it's that is not a an option they think they're, they're going to pursue now it's going to rumble on for sure isn't it over the coming weeks it's well years I mean if, if we're looking at 2028 for when they're actually going to join Formula One so but we'll, we'll keep you posted with any developments and any more visits uh, to the Andretti factory but let's get back onto China Craig we're going to let you go soon because I know you know you you, <laughs> you had quite a long flight over to China I was on the plane with some of Bernie's old colleagues uh, at Aston Martin who are really excited about Alonso re-signing I think they see that as a real declaration of of uh, his faith and where the team is going. Um, we spoke about him before Bernie, didn't we? Is he the appropriate person to lead the team on? Might they have got Carlos Sainz in, I guess. Do you, do you think it's a net positive he's carrying on there? Or? Well, I think from an Aston Martin side, that'll continue, they'll continue to develop the car. They know Alonso as a driver. They've got big changes coming in 26, remember, because you're going back to the Honda engine and they're doing their own gearbox design. So there are two big changes to Aston Martin as a team that are going to need driver input and development to make that work together as a car when it hits the road in 2026. Um, so th there's positive in that. You know, if we think that Alonso is going to be, you know, very old compared to the rest of the grid, and we don't think he's old, but old compared to the rest of the grid, then I my belief is when you see the likes of Oliver Behrman, Liam Lawson, these guys doing really good things in cars, really strong things in cars, then should you be invested in the future? Now, arguably, Alonso is performing at such a high level that maybe that's not true, but there there is a limit to that road. Um, so I think, you know, the team were so positive when he joined and the feedback from him was 
you know, really, really good. So I think that will help develop that team to get to hit the ground running in 2026. And they have to get over the development errors that they made last year. You know, that car got slower through the year before returning into form at the end of the year. So they've got to figure out where their development profile is sort of went wrong there. So consistency from that is not a bad thing. Craig, what what else is catching your attention this week in, in, in the in the paddock? I'd say there's been there has been a lot of news, hasn't there, since since we were last last racing in, in Japan. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean the Alonso story. So we're now looking at Carlos Sainz, what's he gonna do? What are his options? Is his best option now? Clear than anything else, maybe the Audi drives and what's currently sober. Have Mercedes have they increasingly zeroing in and Kimi Antonelli? That, that's we'll maybe get a bit more on that this weekend. Sergio Perez saying he's you know within a month. Is he only one or two more good results away from being confirmed in that Red Bull seat? And then, then we've got Daniel Ricciardo, I guess, trying to reassert himself this weekend too, which is a a storyline, Bernie, you, you, you probably think Japan was a, a very, always going to be a very strong Red Bull track. M- maybe the others have got a bit a bit more of a chance here. Yeah, I think Japan was a strong Red Bull track, the high speed in particular. And I think, you know, it's been a long time since we went to China. I think there was some massive statistic about the number of people that currently watch an F1 that won't ever have watched the Chinese Grand Prix. But it's a lot of low speed corners and then big long straights. So it's a lot of stop start almost and that's very different demands to japan in terms of the high speed so it it might that and we we are seeing signs even in japan the margin wasn't what it had been in previous years in qualifying and it wasn't what it had been in racing so i think that we are getting to a point where the field is you know showing positive signs and can this very different track you know advance those signs even further which is a perfect segue into <laughs> the track specifically, and how and how it's gonna and and how it's gonna evolve across the weekend. Craig, uh, we we might bid you farewell at this point because I know it's late over there and you've got your lantern and maybe <laughs> I wonder if your oil is running out. <laughs> I need to find my way back to my room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, before I do go, I mean, I, what, one last thing, and I, I kind of always get to see stuff that you talked about uh, before you you go on camera. And, do go on camera, but it, I, 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 we talked about China coming back, and I, I'm just pleased, I suppose, um, not to get too heavy, but I, I do think sport brings people together. Um, it, it is great to have international participation. Maybe China, people have a bit of anxiety about China at the moment and its place in the world, but it, it's, it's so reassuring to come here. People are so friendly. And really embracing Formula One, and and, and, it's, and they're getting to see the, the, the big international contingent of folk coming in uh, that F1 does bring, and it's you know that it does have an impact on a place when Formula One comes to town because there are so many people. I mean, yes, it's, it's that that carbon footprint, but in a positive sense, it's a, it's a human footprint, and it's it's great interaction. And for those that that ask about what, why does F1 go to certain places. So many, I think, good people uh, and go out and engage uh, in the various countries that, that, that F1 travels to. That, that that is a very positive aspect. So I, I, it's ha- nice to be here, and I'm really looking forward to, to uh, yeah, to, to this to be a, a really good weekend. Fingers crossed. Um, and now you can get to sleep with the crazy time difference that, that there's going to be. <laughs> Craig, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Have a, have a good time uh, in China. Okay, so this, this Bernie would be a perfect opportunity to talk about everything that's happened since the last Chinese Grand Prix in 2019, which was won by Lewis Hamilton ahead of Valtteri Bottas, his, his teammate, of course, back in 2019 at Mercedes, and Ferrari Sebastian Vettel. We've had Hamilton win a sixth and a seventh, seventh world title. Max Verstappen has won 52 races uh, since then. There's been a few other things that have happened in, in the five years, but we'll, we'll let people at home fill in those blanks. But this weekend, we've got so much unknown, haven't we? Because we haven't raced there in five years, and we don't have data on this current set of cars on that track. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, to to fill in a little bit of what happens is, you know, if we get 
if we miss a, a year with a track or if we go to somewhere like Melbourne or Japan that we've not been to or that we were at last year, we sort of iterate the numbers from last year based on what we've seen so far this year. So we tweak tyre models a bit, we'll tweak pace a bit, we'll tweak the pit loss a bit. All these things have little iterations of, you know, tweaks from year to year. And that's how we, we start the weekend with, you know, a, a revised how the strategy is going to look, how the car is going to look, how the setup is going to look, so many things. You know, what's right downforce level? So many questions we go into a race weekend with. And if you miss a year, then you go to the year before. And yes, there's more error, but it's not too bad. You know, generally you can go, you're going back to the same, you know, in this case, if you went back two years, you go back to the same type of cars, the same aero regs, same tyre compounds, you know, the same sort of like um, bigger diameter wheels that we have now. Oh, so, so you're making a bigger step, but not ridiculous. To go back to 2019 is huge. You know, simple things like, I was looking at some of the notes from 2019. In 2019, when we were here, we were testing the VSC because we didn't have mm. a VSC. Wow. And, yeah. you know, we've got different aero platforms now, very different cars. You know, if you looked at, I have not actually done it, but if you compared like Japan qualifying time in 2019 mm. to this year, it would be a big difference. Um, so there is going to be a big step. The drivers are not going to be used to it. And, you know, that step's going to affect everything from, like I say, you know, obviously strategy, but car setup, simulators that the drivers have done in advance, you know, which springs, dampers, you know, all the things that you put in the car before it gets to the track or you're thinking about putting it in the car before it gets to the track. And interestingly, reading, you know, one of the press releases, Mercedes press release, they're saying that, which I forgot to consider, um, the China's built on quite soft land so the track moves we've got a similar problem at austin actually wow. the track yeah. moves a little bit over time now year on year you can sort of progress that but we don't know what's happened to this track since 2019 we don't know if it's been resurfaced when you look at um i, I always look at the, the circuit website see how much it's used you know see what gt is happening or whatever whatever's happening and, you know, it's a very underused circuit, definitely in the last few years. So there is, it's in an unknown condition. We're getting there and we just we just don't know. And that's going to be a big, big challenge for the team. On a normal weekend, that would be a challenge for teams. On a sprint weekend, <laughs> it is going to be a big challenge for, for drivers and teams. Yeah, and we, we learned actually from the press conference in Japan with, with Carlos Sainz, he or Ferrari seemed to think there has been some resurfacing yeah. on the track. He, yeah. he, he went on record saying that we don't, but you, to your point, we don't know how much resurfacing. It could be one or two corners. And we discussed it in the podcast last week, actually, with regards to Turkey from, from 2020. And when you had a brand new resurfaced track, and I think F1 was one of the first categories to ever go on that track. And you had drivers sliding left and right and for us at home it was it was brilliant and it was entertaining and it was very interesting i think for the drivers and for the teams i'm sure you looked at it and went this is a nightmare we we, we don't have enough certainty on what we're seeing yeah and like you will tend to you know what the track was like before in terms of roughness like you won't believe the extremes that teams go in this they'll be trying to figure out you know what supplier manufacturer came up with the tarmac for that track because they'll have a certain grade that they tend to use or a certain certain roughness that it's been before you know the other thing like i say would be the bumps have they got rid of any of the bumps are the bumps worse you know have they managed to level them out what's happening because the bumps really affect these aero cars because you're, you're so reliant on that contact between the floor um, and the track so there will be a lot going on and it's just going to be your track walk I'd imagine teams are going early to do a track walk maybe on a Wednesday to get a bit ahead of the game on that one for some people who haven't seen the Chinese Grand Prix track before just give us a give us an outline of what sort of track it is what are there any similarities to other tracks on the calendar what what could what could we expect well I'll, I'll ask you that question when you think when you imagine the circuits do you imagine like what they're a shape that they represent in your head when you think about it well, like uh, the upside down pig from Las Vegas. Last exactly. Year. That's, that's exactly. got to be the most famous one. So, oh, yeah. go on. What are you, what, what are you putting what in the Chinese Grand Prix? What do you think when you see us China? Do you, do you have the map in front of you? Let me, let me just get it up again. Here we go. Uh, oh, what a great question. I think it's an upside down giraffe. So, if you turn it <laughs> or 90 a, degrees or a dog. and it's body on skis. Oh, of course it is. Yes. 
So whenever <laughs> I think of the Chinese Grand Prix, I imagine a bunny on skis. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's where I get to. So <laughs> I'm not sure that's not sure that's the right way to describe it, but yeah. you know that's the way I remember it. An upside it, my down head. pig, bunny on skis. I wonder, yeah, if, the, if any any track designers out there listening, think about the animal <laughs> before you think about the track. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, what, I mean, what what kind of um, you know, it's it, what what are we going to expect in terms of slow speed, high speed corners, and and, and the amount of straights? Yeah. So China, you know, has got two massive straights. Um, the one on the start finish straight and the one sort of immediately before that. And a lot of the corners, even though it might not be obvious in the track map, but turn one, two, they are very low speed corners. So like 100 kph. So I don't know what that is, 60 mile an hour. So very low speed corners. And there's quite a few of those in the track. So you tend to have big straight, big breaking zone, another big straight, big breaking zone. Right? There's a few corners that are high speed sort of in the sector two region. But not a lot. So it's gonna it's very, very different to the Suzuka we had the week before. So you know, Japan only had really two slow speed corners. Now we've got mainly slow speed corners and a lot of long straights. So it's gonna be about straight line speed of the car, you know, at much, much more than what it had been previously and how good the cars are on that low speed. We'll get on to who that might favour a little bit later. But but I wanna and you mentioned it earlier, the, the sprint weekend element of all of this so yeah not only is it you know that plenty of drivers who haven't raced here for five years we've still got four drivers who've never raced here at all so the sprint weekend i'll just go through it in terms of how it's of how the new structure works this is as i said at the top the new sprint format for 2024 so we've got practice one friday morning we've then got the sprint qualifying on friday p.m before the sprint race on saturday morning and then we go into the normal qualifying for the race on Saturday afternoon before the race on Sunday. So it now, fr- from my perspective, it feels like we've gone much more chronological throughout the weekend. It's less yeah. poor Rachel or Nat in the pen going, oh my <laughs> goodness, which race is this? Are you on pole? Are you like trying yeah. to work it out? I think now it's going to be much clearer. We're going to know where we are in the weekend. What do you think? I mean, obviously the teams have, have approved it, so they must they must be in favour of it. Do, do you see a similar thing from your perspective? Do, do you think it's it's moved to a different uh, different format for a positive change? Um, I think there's a lot of positives to it. I think the big thing from the viewers at home is, you know, there was a lot of feedback that having qualifying on a Friday afternoon or Friday evening doesn't suit, you know, the majority of the working population. So now having qualifying back on a, on a Saturday evening and then having the race on Sunday, that fits, you know, a lot of what people, you know, the two sessions that people like to watch. I think that's positive. I think that... You know, the, the whole idea of the sprint is that you've more competitive sessions. It brings, com, you know, a competitive session to Friday and that will work. I think one of the difficulties that we had in, you know, the very first formats of sprints was that we didn't want to have used all the qualifying tires before qualifying. And I think the current format, because in sprint qualifying for the first and second sprint qualifying sessions, you need to use a medium tire. So that means that when you get to, you know, qualifying for the race on Saturday evening, you're going to have enough soft, or you should have enough soft tyres to progress through that. So I think there is, it is a good balance now. I think the other thing that teams were um, res- not resistant to, but I think hesitant about was at the moment now they can, Park Fermi is different across the two sessions. So what that means is you can have one setup for sprint qualifying and sprint race, and then if for whatever reason that doesn't work or you want to make a slight change, you can then change that setup slightly for the main qualifying and the main race. I think that's going to be a benefit because obviously in the sprint um, in the sprint session, you're only you're not starting anywhere near the same fuel load that you would be in the in the main race session. So there will be teams will have tricks to play there across those two. Obviously, weather conditions comes into it as well. So I think, you know, teams and drivers are going to have to be on top of it straight away now. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting um, to see how it goes. I think out of all the, the sprint sort of formats we have, it, it does seem the most reasonable. Um, but I'm, we'll figure that out as we go. Only taken us three years, what is it, four years since we've had the sprint <laughs> yeah. to get to get to this point. Let's see. I'm sure there'll be more tweaks going forward. It was interesting what you were saying about the part Fermi rules. I think that will definitely help teams because particularly if you look at this weekend in China, if you get it wrong in FP1, 
you in the previous iteration of the regulations would have kind of been screwed throughout the whole weekend. You you never would have been able to get on top of that. Whereas at least now, I guess you get the chance to reset, give it another go. You're, you're more likely to get more out the, out the weekend. Yeah, which is positive and negative. It's positive for the teams 100%. From a team's point of view, that's what you would have wanted. You'd want to try and get you know your ideal setup for um, the sprint and then your ideal setup for the race. Remember that you might be thinking of different tyres across the two. We're not quite sure what's going to happen with that yet. So from a team side, that's really good. From our side, you know, it was nice to see the risk of people getting it wrong. And, you know, if people go into the weekend struggling a bit with the balance and then are stuck with that for the whole weekend, you know, that can spice things up a little bit. Um, we But we are still going to get, you know, like I say, all the unknowns with China. And we've not been there in so long. So all of the data, the models that the teams are running are going to be a lot less accurate than they would like although not as bad, I guess, as a new race, to then have only one practice session to sort all of that out, high and low fuel, get the setup right, et cetera, et cetera. Going into that sprint qualifying on Friday um, afternoon, evening, is going to be difficult. It's going to be really difficult for the teams. So, and the teams and the drivers, because like you say, a number of the drivers not raced there before. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a big unknowns, I think. It's exciting. I, I'm definitely excited to see it. I wonder, I mean, we sort of asked this question at the top, the, the sort of overall question really that I wanted to ask on this podcast is, is this going to be the most unpredictable Formula One race in years? I mean, we, we, there seems to be so much unpredictability to this weekend. Maybe we've visited, you know, Vegas, for example, was a new track. Yeah. We'd never visited it before, but we had all the practice sessions just about with the drain cover problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> however, for this, we've got the sprint race added element too. So I wonder, yeah, I mean, you know, can you think of a more unpredictable set of, and also the rain that you, yeah. that you said potentially might, might be coming on Saturday? Yeah, so at the moment we have, you know, we're still a few days out, so let's see, but we're forecast rain for Saturday. Now, the big thing is if we get rain for Saturday morning in the sprint, teams will go into the race with no long da run data. So it'll be like what happened last week in China, except, or not in China, in Japan, sorry. So it'd be like what happened in Japan where there's very little long on data, except you don't have last year to go back on either. So it's going to be, it is going to make those long ones a massive, massive unknown going in. And, you know, we China in the our China in the past has been close between a one and a two stop strategy. So back again to like what we had in Japan, where it is going to be about reaction, about the driver feedback to what's happening, the driver feedback to tires, like getting that set up across the driver and the teams nailed in P1 is going to be really crucial. Um, and it, it is, teams, the simulator runs probably won't be good enough coming into it. So it is going to be about how you react to the issues you find in the car in P1. In terms of teams then that this is going to favour, that that you're that, that are going to potentially go well this weekend, I was, and it's funny you mentioned Mercedes earlier, that, that you'd seen their, their pre-race notes, because surely for a team like Mercedes that are struggling to get on top of this car, that need... I don't know what sort of the perfect race weekend for them might be. It might be a Monza, for example, a super reliable track that they've got loads of data on before and that they know they're going to get three practice sessions in, for example. Whereas this seems to be the exact opposite of what they need. So much unpredictability. But could it work the other way? And could they go, well, everyone's starting from zero and therefore actually maybe we, we might be in with more of a chance this weekend? <clears throat> I think that, you know, previous to Japan, Mercedes were really unhappy with the car and there was a lot of discussion that their simulation wasn't working correctly. So how they're simulating the car reacts to certain changes, to certain environments. So there's a lot of talk the simulation was wrong. That's not great if you're going into a new race or if you're going into a race with a lot of unknowns. If you are struggling to simulate a race that you've been to four times in the last four years, then it's not great for one that you've not been to either unless, you know, two wrongs somehow make a right and you ace the setup. In Japan, they seem to be a lot happier from the off with the setup. So maybe they find something there. The other thing is that a lot of circuits recently, they have not been that strong in straight line speed. Mercedes, and in my head, I had um, McLaren as not strong low speed and not long, not strong in straight line. But actually, I've struggled to find data to back up that thought process when I've been looking <laughs> for it today. But there was a, you know, if they were struggling to, to get the power down coming out of a corner, you, that is really going to hurt you during the entire long straight after that. 
So I think that Mercedes will be apprehensive. They've got one out of three setups, we think, so far this year, bang on. And even then, they were probably the fourth fastest team. So third or fourth fastest team. That's not great going into a new one, I think. No matter how good you try and get your setup, if I guess if the car's fundamentally still got problems and still isn't quick, it's, there's limits to what you can do. So go on, if you... We don't really do previews on the podcast. I'm quite excited by this. We, we actually get the chance to make... I'm not going to ask you to predict who's going to win necessarily, but I mean, what, what are your expectations for who is going to go well? Do you, do you see it as another Max Verstappen domination show or a Ferrari going to be there or thereabouts and, and, and nice and close in behind? I think it'll play to Ferrari's strengths. I think there's a chance that Ferrari will have closed the gap a little bit to Red Bull and maybe taken a little step away from McLaren. But like I say, I'm struggling to really find the data to back up that thought process right now. But, you know, I think that that should be roughly the order. And then between Mercedes and Aston, unclear. Um, I think there have been circuits where Aston has definitely been stronger in a straight line speed. And we know pre-season they said they had worked on um, their DRS switch, so making sure they had a very strong DRS. Um, so that should help them because, you know, the two two very, very long straights that we have. So they might have the edge over Mercedes because that's that's what they've been focusing on. So it might change a few of those little orders around a bit. Um, but yeah, it's going to be very interesting just because I think it is going to be reaction. It's going to be getting through those sessions. And one of the things I actually really enjoy about a sprint is for the sprint qualifying, you do the first two qualifiers on medium, then you do the third one on soft. And that means that you can get your ideal setup for that medium, but the driver for SQ3 has to make the difference. You know, it is about the driver making the difference on that soft tire and getting it, getting it right, potentially first time. We don't know how well the soft tire is going to last here. So are you going to risk it and not do more than one lap on that soft in SQ3? Let's see, but there's a, there's a lot to play for uncertainty unpredictability fancy that in formula one I know. Um, that's great that's that's a brilliant sell uh, for this weekend so look just time to just time to tell you what 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 the times are these are all uk times so apologies if you're not in the uk you might have to do a bit of maths but friday fp1 starts at 4 30 before sprint qualifying at 8 30 in the morning then saturday we're on air for the sprint race from 3 30 a.m for a race start at four then we're building up to quality from 7 a.m the session starts at eight and then sunday we're on air from seven for a race start of 8am, which is relatively sociable. Look, for a far eastern race, that's relatively sociable. Um, I, Bernie, you you will be... You, can I say you're on holiday? Yeah, you can say I'm on holiday. Um, I was just going to say, I appreciate, appreciate not everyone's in the UK, obviously, and people do watch Formula One, thankfully, at some horrendous time zones, but that time works really well for me in the UK. I like the yeah. very early morning ones or the very late evening ones because you can sort of do stuff in the middle of your day. But yes, I'm going on holiday. I'm going away with some friends. They are, um, well, one of them in particular, Colin, he won't mind me saying, is a massive F1 fan. So I think even though I'm on holiday, I'll probably still yeah. be watching the F1. Um, but yes, hopefully in sunnier climes than the disappointing UK we have at the minute. <laughs> Oh, I know it's so windy here in London. I keep being blown around left, right, and centre. But yeah, um, it's good. It's, I, I'm really excited for this weekend. I think I think it's going to be really interesting. But maybe we're all excited for a good old fashioned European start time after these flyaways. I say that on behalf of people who work on it in the UK. Um, look, Bernie, thank you so much for your time. No problem. Really appreciate it. Have a lovely weekend uh, on holiday. Uh, we're going to be back next week uh, to look back at what is undoubtedly going to be an unpredictable Chinese Grand Prix. So I hope you can join us then. Bye for now. 